Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. GSMC Football Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. And as always, I am your host, Jesse Tapia. So it's Monday, start out the week, but show's going to be a little bit, little bit different this week. This week, we have Ariana Ariane sent in on this week. She'll be um, doing the show with me this week, giving her thoughts. Go ahead and tell the people hi, Ariane. Hi. Yeah, so she'll be with us this week on the A Football Show. And yeah, that's pretty much all that's going to be happening this week. I mean, show's not really going to change, except now I got someone else to hear my rants and all that. It'll be fun. You'll get used to it. I get pretty loud, but like I said, you'll get used to it. So what we're doing today, I want to talk about all the games that obviously took place on Sunday. We're going to be doing the Sunday night game, recapping that for the second segment. Third segment, we'll be getting to Panthers and Falcons, Steve Sarkeesian. They did a little bit better this week. They actually scored in the red zone. That's a first. But either way, we'll be talking about that for the third segment. Fourth segment, as I always do for Monday's show, I will, well, we will be talking about or previewing the Monday Night Football game between the Bears and Seahawks. Either way, I didn't give in to the bait last week that you guys all tried giving. I get the Jets blew out Detroit and on Monday Night Football. I get we wanted to make Sam Darnold the next biggest thing. Like you did with Sanchez, like you did with Gino, like you've done with every other quarterback. I didn't give into it. I made the Dolphins winning this week my lock of the week. I was right, not to brag, but like I said, not too wrong about my locks usually. Sorry, New York fans, but the media does overhype you guys a bit. You're probably going to win six to seven games. It's all right. I like Darnold though, and we'll, we will talk about that on this segment. Either way, I mean, we got a lot of different storylines too. I mean, Josh Gordon seems like he's going to be getting to the. Uh, traded to the Patriots pretty soon. I'm recording this around 1 o'clock. Hasn't happened yet, but we'll see. So getting into the games themselves, let's start off with the Chargers and Bills. So a couple weeks ago, I was going through each team's schedule, picking wins and losses and all that. Really didn't find a game the Bills would be favored in, one they think they could win. Maybe they take one against the Jets. Either way, I'm not sure they even get one this year. They lost to the Chargers 31-20. to And... I mean, at first, you had Vontae Davis, once a solid corner in the league, deciding, I'm good, you guys go ahead, play the second half yourself, I'm going to go ahead and retire, and like I said, go ahead and finish the rest of your season. What do you think of a player retiring during halftime? Like, like I said, that's never, that's literally never happened before. What do, you, what do you think about that? I feel like it was a little disrespectful to his teammates. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, me... You know what, yeah, it is disrespectful to the teammates. You could have definitely, I mean, finished out the second half. I mean, I saw Vontae Davis. He put out like a little Twitter statement or whatnot. But basically talking, he had a nice little graphic too, made it all look pretty. But <laughs> either way, talking about how Jesus didn't have it anymore, didn't feel right or anything like that. And I mean, I don't hate it. Again, Ariane is right. It's a little, it is, it is disrespectful to the teammates. It's kind of where this, yeah, it's a job. But again, these are the guys you're going out to battle with. One thing I credit Vontae Davis with is the fact that he waited till week two. He does this week, well, actually, yeah, he waited till week two. If he would have retired before week one started, he doesn't get his $5 million guarantee. I think that's a little bit smart. You think he had that planned at all? I don't know, maybe just to see how week one went for him, to, to fill the vibe, but... Yeah, it, it, I don't know, like I said, it's a bold move just retiring in the middle of halftime, but I mean, like I said, how can you expect the Bills to win any games? Like, I get the whole, last week they got blown out by Baltimore 47-3 and all that, but I mean, now you have stories like this coming out, usually that's not great for your season upcoming, and I'm a Bills fan, I'm firing up Madden. 
We're going to play the franchise mode because that's the only way we'll win a bunch of games this season. But either way, Chargers won that one 31-20. to Phillip Rivers, 256 yards, three touchdowns. Austin Eckler, I mean, solid backup running back at 11 carries for 77 yards. Chargers, obviously, nice little pick-me-up compared to last week when they lost to the Chiefs. Obviously, you're expected to beat the Bills, and they did that. So, nice little win there. Then, I mean, it happened again. Again, I don't understand why we have ties in the NFL. But, like I said, another one happened. Vikings, Packers, they tie 29-29. Do you like ties in the NFL or do you think they need to change it? I'm not a fan of ties in the NFL. I think they should change it. Yeah. I don't really... I I was talking with Tate. We were talking with Tate before the show and all that. He says... I mean, way back when. He's older than us. Not too old or anything like that. Don't want to say anything <laughs> rude. But, yeah. He says that there was times where games would go multiple overtimes and teams would just suffer because of it. I get that. I really do. But this is where I put my fan hat on. I don't want to see a tie. Let me have a second overtime. Like, at least maybe if we get a second overtime and if after that they're still tied, sure, whatever. You don't want to overwork them. But I don't need a tie. I don't. I don't want a tie. And yes, I sound a little entitled here, but come on. I mean, really, it makes, it makes no sense. Ties are cool in soccer. NFL, we don't need them. The NBA doesn't do ties. The NCAA doesn't do ties. Why does the NFL feel the need to have ties? And I guess, I mean, it gives me something to talk about and everyone else, but again, don't like it. Either way, Vikings, Packers, 29-29. Clay Matthews gets hit with one of the worst roughing the passer penalties I've ever seen in my life. Did you get a chance to see that one? I did see that. I, I did not like that call at all. Yeah, neither did I. I mean, you look at it, he arm tackled him. He didn't even hit him with a shoulder. He didn't leave with the helmet. I feel Clay Matthews did exactly what he needed to do. He literally arm tackled the guy. It honestly kind of helped out Kirk Cousins, gave him a bit of a hug as they're rolling around and all that. I don't get how that was a roughing the passer penalty. I watched it a few times just to try and see maybe the ref saw this. I don't get it. I mean, it cost him. Clay Matthews also almost cost the Packers the week before with a roughing the passer penalty, but thankfully Mitch Trubisky, like I said, was a bit shook because Aaron Rodgers came back in that second half and dominated. Either way, again, not good. Not I'm not with ties. I don't like the roughing the passer penalties. Either way, we got the Vikings and Packers tying in this one. Then you move on to the Texans and Titans. Sean Watson played better in this one compared to last week. I mean, last week the Patriots made him look like a rookie. This week, Deshaun Watson goes 310 yards, two touchdowns, one pick. But they lose 20-17. to No Marcus Mariota in this one. I don't think Marcus Mariota is very good. I mean, I've been kind of teetering who's better, Jameis or Marcus Mariota, ever since they came into the league. I've always been a big Jameis guy. Obviously, the guy isn't too smart off the field. I mean, we've seen that. And, I mean, if he messes up, I'd say the Bucks need to cut him. But either way, I mean, you're looking at it. Neither of them have really turned out. But either way, the Titans won this one 20-17. to Blaine Galbert, 13-20, 117 yards and a touchdown. I mean, Deion Lewis, they ran the ball about 32 times with Deion Lewis and Derrick Henry combined. Derrick Henry had 18 carries for 56 yards. Deion Lewis, 14 carries for 42 yards. Texans obviously not off to the start that they wanted to be on. I mean, I was expecting this team to be a solid playoff team. Dug themselves a bit of a hole starting out 0-2, but either way, I'm sure they'll pick themselves up off of it. Next game, Saints-Browns. I mean, if we had circus music, I'd play it. The Browns are ridiculous. Go ahead and give your thoughts on the Browns. I mean, the Browns are the Browns. The Browns are the Browns. I mean, they're showing a little bit of improvement, but how much can you expect with the Browns, really? Yeah, and she's right. I mean, they're showing improvement, but it's like, I don't know what it is. They're literally cursed. They are cursed. I mean, how... You know what? I feel kind of bad for Zan Gonzalez, the kicker, but then again, you are a kicker. You have one job. Take it through the uprights and you'll be good. I saw after the, the next day, they were talking about he had a groin injury and all that. I don't really buy into injuries after you have a bad game. If you were injured before, probably should have let someone know because then you probably don't lose this game. Either way, the Saints win this one 21 to 18. Saints look like, I mean, doesn't be too harsh. Garbage in this one, too. All right. Only three points in the first quarter and didn't really turn it on till the fourth. That's a problem. Again, the Saints won 21 18. You took care of business. Either way, I'd say me saying they're going to miss on the playoffs looks pretty nice as of right now. Again, it's only week two, so. 
I'm tooting my horn a, horn a little bit too soon. Either way, I mean, Zane Gonzalez missed field goal after field goal after field goal. And this wasn't like, he wasn't missing like 55 plus yards or anything like that. Like, these were fairly easy kicks to make if you're a professional kicker in the NFL. So I'm not sure what Hugh Jackson is going to do. I know the Browns like to keep people around a little bit longer than they should, a la Hugh Jackson. I mean, how do you keep a guy after going 1-31? Either way, I don't see Zane Gonzalez going anywhere. And you also got Carlson, the kicker for the Vikings. Zimmer cut him. Zimmer was, I mean, pretty much straight up about it. He was asked about it today. Asked, asked the media, did you watch the game yesterday? They said, yeah. So, so it was a pretty easy decision. They signed Dan Bailey. So now they got one of the best kickers to ever do it, I'd say. So moving on from that one. You got the Dolphins and Jets, and again, I didn't take the bait. I know how the New York media is, and I'm not trying to discredit Sam Darnold. I think he's going to be a good quarterback. You get him some actual receivers, um, other than Robbie Anderson, meaning get him better receivers than Jermaine Curse, Quincy Anua, and then add those other guys to Robbie Anderson. He'll be a solid quarterback. Either way, Miami pretty much handled the Jets in this one. Miami was up 20-0 to zero at one point, so the Jets, like I say, I mean, it's not really much of a race if you're in second place the entire time. It, Miami won this one 20 to 12 and Darnold looked like a rookie in this one and like I said he'll be fine Brian Tannehill I'm gonna go ahead and say him and Blake Bortles are the exact same quarterback in the sense where they're gonna have these great games like oh maybe they finally turn in the corner here and then they're gonna have games where it's like wait Miami Jacksonville they need to draft a quarterback next season either way Tannehill finally has a defense that can protect them and they're running the ball well with Frank Gore and Kenyon Drake. So like I said, Miami 20 to 12 there. Got my lock of the week right. Then we got the Chiefs and Steelers. The Steelers are imploding. I mean, we saw it in the NBA with the Spurs, Kawhi, all that. All these top-notch organizations where you keep things in-house and everything's ran pretty nice and tight. Stuff's starting to leak out a bit. Either way, the Chiefs won this one 42 to 37. Patrick Mahomes, again, I'm happy about the fact that I jumped on the bandwagon after that preseason game against Atlanta. I mean, again, how do you not like a quarterback after he throws the ball 70 yards in the air? Either way, that's besides the point. Mahomes, 326 yards, six touchdowns. Big Ben played better in this one. No interceptions, 452 yards, three touchdowns there. Steeler fans were telling everyone on Twitter about how James Conner was the truth. They don't need Le'Veon because he ran for, what, 31 carries, 100 and. I think it was 130-something yards, somewhere around there. I can't remember his exact stats from last week. Either way, Connor this week, 8 carries, 17 yards, 1 touchdown. Turns out you probably do need Le'Veon. Steelers players also taking a Twitter. Don't really sound too happy. But Dupree arguing with a fan in his direct messages. And then you had a fan who tweeted at Antonio Brown, basically paraphrasing the tweet, talking about how Ben Roethlisberger makes Antonio Brown. And you might have a point there, not about Antonio Brown, but the fact that the Steelers do really develop wide receivers well. Either way, Antonio Brown made me smile a bit, quoted the tweet, and said, trade me and we'll see. Obviously, if you're the Steelers organization and you're, I'd say, the best player on your team, best receiver in the NFL, it's telling a fan that they should trade him to see how good he actually is. That's a problem. And again, it's trouble in paradise. We're starting to see this with all the top organizations in sports. Stuff starting to leak out. It's not so nice and organized there. So we move on from that game. And you got the Steelers who are now 0-1-1. Oh, Again, I don't like the third column of the record showing me a tie. Either way, that's a story for a different day. Move on. You got the Eagles and Buccaneers. Ryan Fitzpatrick is making it really hard for Dirk Cutter to start Jameis Winston week four. Either way, I mean, Fitzpatrick, 402 yards, four touchdowns, threw a 75-yard touchdown pass on literally the first play of the game after the kickoff return to Deshaun Jackson. And the Bucks actually beat the Eagles 27-21. I felt pretty confident to start the season saying the Bucks were going to go 0-3 with Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick obviously trying to prove me wrong, I guess. Do the Bucks have... Questions as far as week four, who do you start, Jameis or Fitzpatrick? As far as this season, short-term, wins and losses, yes. As far as long-term, I don't think so. We know Ryan Fitzpatrick. One good season with the Bills, one good season with the Jets. You start Fitzpatrick this year, he'll win 
eight, nine games, I'll give it to them. They got a solid team out there with Mike Evans, Deshaun Jackson, you got OJ Howard. But do you really want Fitzpatrick starting next season? No. Fitzpatrick has been in the league 10 plus years. We know what he is. Move on. James has got the upside. Figure out whether or not that's your franchise. I mean, what do you think? I agree. Yeah, so she agrees with me. Again, I don't think you really go with Fitzpatrick the next season. So we move on, and I felt pretty confident about this pick. I was wrong. Shout out to the Redskins for proving me wrong there. But Andrew Luck seems to be fully back, meaning, I mean, it's we saw this Colts team go 4-12 and last year. And now Andrew Luck has them competitive. They beat the Redskins 21-9. to Alex Smith, typical Alex Smith game here. 33 of 46, 292 yards. Looking at Luck, he threw the ball about 53, team, 53 times last season. The Colts cut that down 31 times this or this week. He threw for 179 yards, two touchdowns, two picks. But, I mean, Colts defense playing well, holding the Redskins to nine points in this one. Moving on from that game. We look at the Cardinals and Rams. I'd say the Cardinals, as high as I was on them, looking like they... Might be just as bad as the Bills. You got the Rams taking care of business there. There's not really much to say about this game. They go win thirty, uh, win this one 34-0. I'm not sure really what's going on with Arizona. I mean, I feel like it's fairly easy to give the ball to David Johnson and have your outfits run through him. It's not really happening here. Like I said, not too much is needed on this game. The Rams took care of business 34-0. Then we had the 49ers and Lions playing each other. Lions, obviously, we saw them get embarrassed on Monday Night Football against the Jets. San Francisco won this one, 30-27. You saw Stafford go for 347 yards, three touchdowns. Before, um, Garoppolo played better in this one than he did last week, obviously throwing three picks against Minnesota. He threw for 206 yards, two touchdowns, and again, 49ers nearly blew it. What do you think of Jimmy Garoppolo? I mean, there was a lot of talk about him being the next biggest thing. The Patriots obviously make a mistake trading him, which I think they did. But what do you think of him coming into his second, I guess his first full season? I feel like he did okay. The Patriots, I feel, should have kept him just so he could just so he could learn under somebody like Tom Brady. And, you know, a little bit, perfect his skill a little bit more. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, now they got film on him and all that. I mean, like I said, no interceptions this week, so that's a bit of a plus. So we move on from that game, looking at the Raiders and Broncos. Gruden, 0-2. Broncos, 2-0. Case Keenum might actually be a good quarterback. I thought a lot of last season was the fact that Pat Shermer was his offensive coordinator, and he elevated Keenum in his ability. Shermer's 0-2, so I'm inclined to think Keenum, like I said, is a good quarterback. He brought the Broncos actually from behind. I mean, the Raiders were leading a lot of this game. Broncos put up 10 in the fourth. Raiders, I mean, blank in the fourth. Goose egg there. Carr, 288 yards and a touchdown. Gruden called him out a bit for not throwing to Amari Cooper. Carr obviously heard that message. 10 receptions for Cooper, 116 yards, no touchdowns. That's nice. Can they do it consistently? We'll see. Looking at the Broncos. Keenum, 222 yards, no touchdowns, one pick. Case Keenum is not Tom Brady. But you can be a good quarterback by managing the game and keeping your team in it. Denver has needed that type of quarterback for the last two years. They haven't had it. So now Keenum just needs to keep him in the game so the defense can handle business there. Von Miller's been doing it. Phillip Lindsay. I mean, running back pretty much coming out of nowhere. 14 carries, 107 yards there. And then for the final game for this segment, because again, we will be talking Panthers-Falcons later on. And last night's Sunday night game in the next segment. You got Pats, Jags. I mean, the Patriots, as dominant as they've been, look like they bent the knee a bit to the Jags. A bit on, wouldn't you say, considering it's the Patriots? Yeah, I was impressed with the Jaguars, though. They they handled it. Yeah, I mean, you got Blake Bortles, four touchdowns, 330, or 377 yards. Again, I say this, Blake Bortles, Ryan Tannehill, the same type of player. They're going to give you these big games, but they're also going to give you those games where you think, okay, maybe we need to draft a quarterback in next year's draft. Like I said, 377 yards, four touchdowns. Again, did this without Leonard Fournette. Looking at how Gronk did, because again, Jalen Ramsey has been talking a lot, pretty much saying that Gronk isn't all he's made out to be. Did the Jags back it up? Yes. Gronk, 
only two receptions for 15 yards. This is the first time I've ever seen anyone pretty much limit a guy like Gron- uh, limit a guy like Rob Gronkowski. So, I mean, like I said, Jacksonville dominated. They were up, I think, 32-13 at one point. So this is one where, I mean, the Patriots were never really in it to begin with. I'm not really putting too much stock into this game either. The Patriots always start off slow in September. They're going to win the AFC East. They'll be in the divisional game in the playoffs without a doubt and most likely will be in the AFC Championship. But again, I don't expect them to go to the Super Bowl this year. But again, we've already talked about that. So we're going to wrap up the segment here. I will be talking Cowboys-Giants for the next and we will be getting to Panthers Falcons for the third. So stay tuned for that and we will be right back. The average sedan is built with a steel frame and equipped with six airbags. Remember this the next time you see someone walking. Drivers be aware. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. The average SUV has two blind spots, weighs between four and six thousand pounds, and takes about six seconds to stop. Remember this the next time you're on foot. Pay attention, people. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. All right, and welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. We have me, obviously Jesse Tapion, with Ariane, but we do have a special treat for this second segment. We've had Tate on a few times. Me and him have gone back and forth. We've had a couple of long episodes when you've been on here. I think it went for two Oh, we've had, we've had a few. Yeah, so and, Tate... And we're actually going to have a, another conversation later on. Because you do the sports show, and we are definitely talking about sports. All right, yeah, I can't wait for that one. I'm assuming we'll be talking Canelo Triple G along with maybe something else. But either way, we got Tate back on. We're here to talk about his Cowboys. You guys have heard me talk about the Cowboys. I think Dak is Alex Smith 2.0. I'm not too high on him, but either way, yesterday he did look better. And we'll get into the stats first, and then we'll all chime in and give our thoughts. So you had the Cowboys winning Sunday night, 20-13. to 13. I picked the Giants to win this one on Friday. I didn't think the I don't think the Cowboys do well on Sunday night at home against the Giants, but this one they played much better. Dak sixteen to twenty five, throwing the ball, hundred and sixty yards passing, one touchdown. Also took off with it seven times for forty five yards there. Ezekiel Elliott seventeen carries, seventy eight yards and a touchdown. Dak Prescott same thing as last week. Well, actually did better this week to spread the ball out more. I mean, the highest amount of receptions by one player was from Deontay Thompson, who had four receptions for thirty three yards. Tavon Austin, who, Tate, what do you think of Tavon Austin? I, I need to hear your thoughts on him. All right. Um, Tavon Austin, disapp- disapp- his career so far has been disappointing. When he got drafted initially, I thought Tavon Austin was going to be a superstar. And I'm kind of excited about Tavon Austin as a whole for the Cowboys because I feel like uh, when Tavon was in, um, I keep wanting to say San Diego, but but I say that they were with the Rams. When he was with the Rams, I thought they never used him properly. And from what I have seen by listening listening to things that uh, have was said in the preseason of how they plan the Cowboys plan on using Tavon, I'm very curious to see if he finally rises to the occasion. He had a good game this one. Will that keep on? That's to be seen. Yeah, these teams basically got themselves a Percy Harvin 2.0, but no one really knows how to use the guy. By the way, like I said, he went for two receptions, 79 yards and a touchdown. You look at the Giants side of things, Eli Manning, breaking my heart. It's kind of like, I mean, I think the guy's a first ballot Hall of Famer, but it might be time to hang it up a bit. He just doesn't look good. Uh, Threw the ball 44 times, 33 completions there, 279 yards, and a touchdown. Ariane, what do you think of Eli Manning this late in his career? Can he still help the Giants win games, or is he kind of like a lost cause at this point? 
No, I think he can still help them win games. Um, getting hit as many times as he did yesterday was a bit of a struggle for him, but I still think he's got a little bit of fire left. And Arion does have a point there. I mean, he did get sacked six times there. Tate, what do you think of Eli? Okay. This is uh, – I because I understand where you're coming from. Uh, is Eli getting old? One of the things that I – as a Cowboy fan, I openly, openly admit I'm a Cowboy fan uh, – Whenever Eli comes to the new stadium, Eli always lights it up. But this new Eli, he wasn't lighting anything up. Uh, I I wasn't I wasn't impressed with what Eli's done so far this year. I wasn't quite impressed how Eli ended last year. Is it a point that Eli may be coming to that edge of that cliff, that proverbial cliff where he may be on the downslide? It might be. It might just be like a kind of family type of thing. We saw Peyton Manning, I mean, have a terrible last season. Although he did get a Super Bowl. Shout out Von Miller for that one. But it, like I said, it might be a family thing. We're just in the jeans maybe to have that one <laughs> bad last season. Now, and here's the thing. You know, when I'm looking at this game, the one thing that really stuck out to me in this game was the fact that the Cowboys defense – looked fantastic. I mean, fantastic. And at first, I was like all fired up. Like, man, the Cowboys got him a defense this year. And then I thought about the first game. And then I realized, no, the Cowboys don't have a defense. The Giants just look that bad. I, I didn't I never necessarily think it was the defense that was that stellar. I just thought the Giants looked that bad. Yeah. And what is your take on that one? I, I completely agree with that. I mean, the Giants... Eli got sacked six times. They supposedly, I mean, improved the offensive line. I haven't seen that. I will say this, though. When you're a defense and you're taking care of business against the bad teams, that just kind of shows that you're doing your job in a way. I mean, Dallas did look quick, got to the ball fast. I mean, Jalen Smith had, I believe it was, 10 total tackles. Demarcus Lawrence was a problem on that defensive line. You had Taco Charlton also. So I will say the Giants did look bad, but actually I will give – a lot of credit to that Dallas Cowboys defense just because they did take care of They business. did look good. I mean, I, I was surprised. I was not expecting that because when you look at this team, you think about uh, you, you think about Ezekiel Elliott. You think about Dak Prescott. You think about that offensive line. There's two areas that you don't think about, and that is defense and wide receiver. And with the Giants, neither one of them were like a bad great against them. The Cowboys looked like a complete team. Yeah, I agree with that. You look back to last week with their game against Carolina, talking about Dallas. They lost, I believe it was 16-8. to Dak got hit or sacked six times. Zeke really couldn't get going. Obviously, that was completely different here. Dallas pretty much, I think, came into this game. It's a prove it. Like, pretty much, we're going to prove ourselves. Type. Dak doesn't get sacked. And I've been about as harsh on Dak as anyone ever has. I mean, like I said, I think he's Alex Smith 2.0. I think right now at the point of his career, he's... I disagree with you on that one, by the way, just just for the record. Uh, yeah, I guess we could disagree. <laughs> I think he's currently San Francisco 49ers before Harbaugh type Alex Smith. He can get better, but he did prove me wrong here. Ariane, what do you think of Dak Prescott? I agree with you. I don't think that he seemed like he has that new out-of-college, you know, you know that the... College football is different from the NFL. So it's like you can play in college, but when you get thrown in, especially last year when he was a um, – or was second it the player. second play? Yeah. He had somebody to back him up. He had his own line to back him up. So when, oh, go ahead. Uh, when he doesn't have an own line to back him up to make those amazing plays, I just think that he's not going to do as great as everybody thinks thinks he's going to. Uh-huh. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me jump in here for a second here and defend my man, Dak Prescott. Okay. First off. His rookie year, fantastic for rookie year. Definitely. Um, Pretty much all the way down to Dan Marino. Every quarterback has that sophomore slump. And last year was Dak Prescott's sophomore sophomore slump. Kind of like Jimmy Garoppolo is having his sophomore slump now. Now, but when you look at what Dak Prescott, Prescott did this week, especially with the receiving core, He's still able to do quite a bit with maybe the worst receiving core in the NFL, and it didn't look that bad this week. 
No, I didn't. And you and do you agree? May, who do you think? Does there is there a team in the NFL with a worse receiving court than the Cowboys right now? I think about it. No, as of right now. Right now, absolutely not. But I will say this. I mean, I feel like the guys they brought in to play the wide receiver position were kind of brought in to fit Dak's abilities. Like you look, yes. Because you look at Alex Smith in Washington. You got Josh Dotson, Jameson Crowder, Jordan Reed, Vernon Davis, and Paul Richardson. Would you say any of those guys are top-end receivers? They're not top-end receivers, but they are all very serviceable receivers. When you look at you, – you have, you have a nice crop of number two – no, number one and a half rank type. They're not really number ones, but I'd say 1.5. Mm-hmm. But when I look at the Cowboys receiving core, at best, you have a crop of number threes. Cole Beasley, number three. Tavon Austin, number four. <laughs> you, you understand where I'm coming yeah. from? They don't have that number one receiver. And for that matter, they don't have that number two receiver. And for a guy like Dak Prescott to put on a performance like he did with the inadequate receivers that he has shows that he has the ability to be elite. You put elite receivers around him, you will have an re- elite quarterback. Just saying. And they just so happened to cut a guy who used to be elite, Des Bryant. Some thoughts on him. Do you think he, like, I mean, we got Josh Gordon, actually, who got traded, I think, 15 minutes ago to the Patriots for a fifth-round pick. I will mention that in the fourth segment. Either way, that's another team without, I mean, the Patriots, who needed a receiver. Now I'd say they're good. You think Dez is going to find himself a spot on a team this season? I have a prediction Dez Bryant is heartbroken right now. Heartbroken. I think he really had his heart set on going to the Patriots. Uh, the Patriots was his was his top choice with Josh Gordon coming coming available and ended up going to the Patriots eliminates his choice don't be shocked if you do not hear that that Dak Prescott sounds with signs with the Browns now do you want me to comment on what I think about the whole Cleveland Brown situation and Josh Gordon or do you want to hold that for another uh, another time? I think we can hold that for another time. I'm okay. really set on the Cowboys here. And also, I got another question. I don't know if you've seen this. Last week, Dez was hanging out with your guy, Jerry Jones, at a Jay-Z and Beyonce concert. Do you think that, like, I think that might be something. I mean, what are they hanging out for? Are they just friends? Or do you think maybe if Jason Garrett doesn't get it done this year, they miss out on the playoffs, Cowboys offense doesn't look good? Maybe, and again, I might be grasping for straws here. Is there ever a possibility for a union for Des to get back to Dallas? You have grasped at that straw, and you have caught it. Des Bryant is not coming back to the Cowboys. Even if they get rid of Garrett and Linehan and the supposed... Garrett is... I mean, he is not coming back to the Cowboys. Um, in my opinion, that mm-hmm. is. One of the things, if you know anything about the Cowboys, the Cowboy Jerry Jones is very loyal to Jerry Jones's guys. Whether you leave come back, whether you're Keyshawn Johnson or Michael Irvin or Emmett Smith or Troy Aikman, Jerry loves his guys. And Dez is without question a cowboy guy. And so am I surprised to see uh, Dez and Jerry together? No. Am I surprised to see him at, at the concert day where is that? Absolutely. freaking <laughs> I I just didn't see that concert be, yeah. being where they were going to be at. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I just don't see Jerry getting down with a little Beyonce, Jay-Z action. I just not, <laughs> yeah, you know. There's a picture of him. And there's people dancing behind him. But Jerry's sitting in his chair pretty much looking like he's just enjoying the event. Now, but- if you told me they were that Dez and Jerry was at a Darius Rucker's concert, I would understand. But Jay-Z, Beyonce, I just didn't see that coming. I guess, but... (laughs) Either way, I mean, you look at Dak, and when I say he's Alex Smith 2.0, I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way. People tend to forget. I think Alex... Well, you're saying it kind of like a bad way. Well, (laughs) like right now, Dak Prescott is at a point in his career where he's early Alex Smith right now. What do you think? He is early Alex Smith, but... Alex Smith, but Alex Smith found his place a little bit when he went to Kansas City. So I feel like Des Prescott can find a place or find his little groove eventually with with um, Dallas. 
Yeah, and I can see that. Like I said, I think he's the early Alex Smith. I think Alex Smith is his ceiling. I think Alex Smith is probably the 10th, 11th. You said sweat. his ceiling? Yeah, that's his ceiling. Folks, we're going to shut this show down. We're about to fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know why everyone's against me on Alex Smith. The guy went to the playoffs four out of his last five seasons with the Chiefs. I mean, he went to the NFC title game with the 49ers. If Kyle Williams doesn't have all those fumbles in that game, they probably go to the Super Bowl. It's not his Trent fault. Trent Dilford went to the playoffs in the Super Bowl, too. Don't mean I want to be called Trent Dilford. That, that's not... <laughs> you you kind of got me there, but Trent Dilford did play with one of the best defenses in NFL history. I just him. had to throw that out there. I'm yeah, sorry. You kind of threw it like a wrench in my heart. You kind of throwing in Trent Dilford, but... I mean... You got me right there. <laughs> I mean, I'm still with Alex Smith. I think I, think I threw him off big time on did, this one. You did, but I still think Alex Smith's a good quarterback. I think Dak, like I said, that's his ceiling. He's never going to be a guy who throws for over 300 yards, 30 touchdowns or anything like that. But with the right amount of development and all, time coming and all that with Zeke, defense seems to be getting better, faster, getting to the ball quicker. Dak's going to be a guy who won't lose the Cowboys a game and will take him to the playoffs more times than not, I'd say. I agree with that part, but his upside is way higher, I, th- I personally think. Mm. And that's not me being a Cowboy fan. It's just actually just looking at his body of work, his rookie year, and then looking even kind of even with not having Ezekiel Elliott last year, but looking at what he what he did last year, the step back was there, but he still was a quite serviceable, adequate quarterback. Yeah. This is now, th- but I will admit. This is the year that determines who he is. Do you agree on that? Yeah, and then one more talking point before we end this segment. Cowboys look absolutely terrible week one. Would you agree? Absolutely. And they look like a completely different team week two against the Giants. What do you think of Dallas? I mean, they got, they're got in Seattle next week. Dallas tends to play well there for some reason. No other team has. But Dallas somehow hasn't figured out um, to go to Seattle. But what do you think of Dallas? I mean, after I mean, basically hot and cold week one. What do you think of them going for the rest of the season? Okay. When I look at Dallas and I look at week one and and week two and how different they are, the truth of the matter is when you look at this team, they're actually in the middle. And and what I say by the what I well reason why I say that is they're not a horrible team, which they look like one of the worst teams in the NFL. But then this week they look like one of the best teams in the NFL. Quite honestly, they're in the middle. I personally think they're gonna be about an eight and eight team where it's Lately, that's been par for the course for the Cowboys. They got a good, they got a solid running game. The wide receivers may be one of the lowest rated wide receiving cores, but they will get on page with uh, Dak as the season goes on and will perform a lot better. That offensive line is solid, and there shows a lot more hope with um, with the defense. And I have, and I have another prediction. We have Seattle this week, which I actually have the Cowboys winning. Mm -hmm. Do not be shocked if Cam Chancellor, after this week, gets traded to the Cowboys. I don't think Seattle really... Earl Thomas? I mean, Earl Thomas. Ooh, Cam Chancellor. That's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? Uh, Earl Thomas, I predict that Seattle did not want to trade him until after they had the game. Now Now that week three is over... I could definitely see that trade happening, a trade where the Cowboys had already offered a number two. I think that number two will be accepted, and after week three, maybe week four, week five, you're going to see Earl Thomas as a Cowboy. That makes a lot of sense. I actually hadn't thought about that. What do you think of the Cowboys for the rest of the season? Do you think it'll be 8-8, eight and eight, maybe a little bit worse, or do you think they'll pick it up? I think it'll be about 8-8. Eight and eight. They're mediocre right now. The first week, it's like you said, they looked horrible. This week, they had help looking good. So that's why I would say they're a little bit mediocre. You'd have to watch them the next couple of weeks to see how they pick it up. Yeah, I think I can agree, agree with that. I'm going about 8-8, eight and eight, maybe 7-9, and nine, somewhere around there. But And that division is super. And, and it's not a really, I'm, I'm going to say this part. It's by calling the Cowboys an 8-8 eight and eight team, that sounds like you're, you're, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a negative thing toward the Cowboys. The fact of the matter is, if you look at their schedule, you look at their division, Redskins, tough. Agree on that one? Yeah. Giants are no pushover, although they were a pushover uh, this God, week. That's kind of scaring me. The Eagles are no pushover, Super Bowl champions. And then you look at the rest of, you look at the rest of that division, the NFC, and you look at the Cowboys' schedule of who they have to play. That is a very tough schedule. When I look at the schedule, I, I think the Cowboys are above average team, but in that schedule, they're 8-8. Eight and eight. 
And I think with that point, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Like I said, for the next segment, the third segment, we will be talking Falcons-Panthers. Falcons-Red Zone offense, a whole lot better than they've shown the last year and last week. So we'll be talking about that. Cam Newton played well, but ended up taking a loss there. So like I said, thanks for listening to this segment, and we will be right back. The average sedan is built with a steel frame and equipped with six airbags. Remember this the next time you see someone walking. Drivers be aware. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. And welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. Last segment, we had Tate on with me and Ariane. He kind of stumped me with that Trent Dilfer um, comment. I mean, Ariane saw it. I looked pretty stumped, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, obviously you guys can't see since it's uh, audio and all that. But yeah, he got me. I can't even <laughs> say anything about it. Either way, so far today, we've talked about pretty much the early games of Sunday. Talked about the Sunday night game. And now we move on. And like I like to do, we'll pick one game from the early games. And we picked Carolina, Atlanta. I've had a big problem with the Falcons. I've had a big problem with Julio Jones. I think he's a top three receiver, top two receiver. Again, you guys have heard, he pretty much ended my fantasy championship hopes last year in the semifinal game when they played Tampa Bay. And I needed Julio one catch for five yards. All I did in the second half, wasn't asking for much. Didn't get it, didn't even get the ball. I haven't been that hurt over a loss in a while. Either way... I mean, obviously he's a great receiver. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, Of course, of course. Yeah, but he did break my heart last year. And Matt Ryan, I'm a big Matt Ryan defender, but he does get happy feet in the red zone. This time, though, it was a lot different for the Falcons. Let me get into the stats, the score, and then me and Ariane will get into our thoughts on the Falcons and anything else that has to do with it. So the Falcons won this one 34-24, beating the Panthers, obviously. Matt Ryan, 23 of 28. Throwing for 272 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. Matt Ryan also channeled his inner Michael Vick. Four carries, 18 yards, two touchdowns there. Those two rushing touchdowns obviously in the red zone. Tevin Coleman filling in for Devontae Freeman who was out with an injury. 16 carries, 107 yards there. Looking at the receiving numbers for the Falcons. Calvin Ridley, four receptions, 64 yards, and a touchdown. Julio, five receptions, 64 yards, no touchdowns. Austin Hooper, five receptions, 59 yards, and a touchdown there. Looking at the Panthers, Cam, 32 of 45, throwing the ball, 335 yards, three touchdowns, one interception, also took off with it five times, 42 yards. Christian McCaffrey, same thing as usual, eight carries, 37 yards, got busy in the receiving end, 14 carries, 102 yards, or 14 receptions, excuse me, 102 yards there. Devin Funches, seven catches, 77 yards. And then you have the third and four guy receivers on the Panthers, Jarius Wright, DJ Moore. Jarius Wright, five receptions, 62 yards and a touchdown. DJ Moore, one catch, 51 yards and a touchdown there. And then old man, Torrey Smith, three receptions, 33 yards and a touchdown there. So I mentioned the red zone issues of the Falcons. Obviously, they cleaned it up a bit here. What do you think of the Falcons? I mean, last season, they they went 10-6 and and made the playoffs, but just kind of felt like they really couldn't get into that second gear. What do you think of them this season? And just your thoughts on the Falcons. I think this season they'll be able to pick it up. They do struggle in the red zone. That's just been an all-time thing for them. I don't get it. They can't finish usually. They're lucky they have a good kicker in... You know, Matt Bryant. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you look at Julio. Julio needs the ball about every other play when it's in the red zone. I don't get why the offensive corner for Atlanta, Steve Sarkeesian, tends to use him as a decoy. It makes no sense to me. It makes me actually kind of angry when it shouldn't. And as you know, I've always been anti-Jeff Fisher. We've moved on for that. I'm now anti-Steve Sarkeesian. I don't think Ariana is anti-Steve Sarkeesian considering these are her Falcons. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, like you said... They did look better, and 
Are you a Matt Ryan fan, or are you kind of eh about it? No, I'm a fan. I'm a fan, definitely. I do feel you on how they need to use Julio Jones. Him, Matt Ryan and Julio Jones have a special connection. They know they know how to fill each other's vibe, and if he just tosses it up to Julio, I feel like they used Julio as the decoy last year, and they're, they're still kind of in that groove. So, Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, and she makes sense. So you got Julio, get him the ball. You look at A.J. Green on Thursday. What did Anthony Dalton do against Baltimore? Every time they were in the red zone, the first option was A.J. Green. That's why he scored three touchdowns in the first half. And as good as A.J. Green is, Julio is about two, five, two to five times the receiver he is. And again, that's not too easy to say considering, I mean, A.J. Green is a beast. But Julio Jones fast. He can run routes well. Go up and get the ball. Throw it to him. That's all you have to do. Literally, that's it. And looking at the score, like I said, it was 31-24. Last week, I was complaining about how Vegas was given the Falcons, who made them six-point favorites there. I guess Vegas does know what they're doing. This is why they make up the lines, and this is why I talk behind this mic and yell. <laughs> All right. Falcons covered, one by seven. But I will say this, Carolina, I mean, I didn't expect them to win at Atlanta. I expect these teams in the NFC South to split their home and away games. I'm expecting Carolina to win in Carolina when they play again. But like I said, I do like the way McCaffrey played. I do like the way Cam Newton has played. I haven't always been the biggest Cam Newton fan. I've never really thought he was too accurate as a quarterback, so that's always why it's kind of like, eh, about him. But again, they are my... Actually, I think I did pick him to go to the Super Bowl. I mean, (laughs) yeah, I did. I think I had them in the Chargers. But either way, I mean, looking at it, Cam played well. And this NFC South division is going to be a bit tough. But as of right now, I guess you could say that Atlanta's the top dog. I mean, New Orleans hasn't really played well last week. They lost to the Bucks. They were playing from behind there. And, I mean, we can't even overlook the Bucks. I forget. I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick has that team playing well. Carolina's 1-1. One and one. The Falcons are 1-9. and none. Bucks are actually 2-0, and oh, now that you think about it. What do you think about this division? What do you think about the Falcons? Is there a division? Is this their division? Is this their division to lose this season, or do you think maybe the Bucks can keep up the play that they're currently um, on right now? I think the Falcons can step it up a little bit more. The Bucks have definitely showed improvement. De- depending on which quarterback they keep, I feel like that's going to determine their the rest of their season if they keep Fitzgerald or if they go back with James. Uh, yeah. James, yeah, and. I like what you said right there about which quarterback they end up going with because that does play into it. I mean, like I said, Jameis, I've always thought he was a better quarterback than Mariota. And that's all nice, but that still doesn't mean you're that good. And looking at Fitzpatrick, I mean, he is the hot hand right now. And you're looking at Dirk Cutter. If Gruden decided that he wanted to go coach Tampa Bay, Dirk Cutter would be maybe doing some analyst job. Maybe he'd be calling into this podcast. Probably not. But either way, he might be a guy who's coaching for his job that this season, considering last season with all the talent they had, they just, I mean, flat out stuck. They weren't that good. So, I mean, if you're Dirk Cutter, you look at it. Do you continue to ride the hot hand and ride with Patrick, or do you make the long-term thinking move and ride with Jameis? Because, I mean, like I said, as good as Fitzpatrick, is, Fitzpatrick has done, he's not who you want starting all 16 games next season. He's never been that type of player. The way I look at it, you look at his career, we know what he is. He's not going to become some out-of-this-world quarterback. He's going to have a nice run. We know how this movie ends, I'd say. So, I guess we'll see what ends up happening there. Getting back to the Falcons, like I said, four touchdowns and four red zone trips. Last Friday, I said I was done talking about their red zone or complaining about their red zone issues. It's just a matter of if they fix it, they fix it. If they don't, it's just going to hurt them all year. Is this something you think they can continue to do? Or, like, yeah, what do you think about it? Because, I mean, this is one time out of a lot of... I mean, we've had plenty of bad instances where they couldn't get it done. So what do you think? Right. Is this something they could keep it going? Or it's like a shot in the pan type, a flash in the pan type of thing? No, I think they'll keep it going. One thing about the Falcons, from what I've been noticing, is they only... It seems like they only work on one thing consistently. So... Like, this year would probably be the red zone. Mm -hmm. Um, Finishing in the red zone, of course. Last year, excuse me, last year was 
oh gosh, what was it? Not fumbling the ball. You could see all the running backs, you know, double handing the ball while, as they're going down or if they see somebody coming close to them. Um, the line with uh, Vic Beasley not making those yeah. um, off uh, false starts, stuff like the that. So he, exactly. That. So they, they only work on one thing, it seems like, instead of, you know, a hole. Yeah, and I could see that. I mean, you pretty, pretty much you'd expect teams to – Work on multiple things, but right. again, like you, see, like you said last year, it was more so the mental issues, not jumping off sides, two hands with the ball, not fumbling or anything like that. But again, if they got that fixed up this year, then obviously the red zone issues is what's up next. And like I said, it's one game. I'm not going to go ahead and say that, oh yeah, the Falcons are fixed or anything like that. I'm more of the, all right, can you do it consistently? Like I said, it's with Ryan Fitzpatrick. I don't think Ryan Fitzpatrick is a good quarterback. And I might be in the minority there, but again, look at his career. Are we going to take two seasons and two games and say, oh, yeah, he's a good quarterback? Or are we going to look at the entire body of work? We look at the entire body of work, it's a fairly easy answer there. But, I mean, again, we'll see how it goes. I'm really concerned about the Saints. I did pick them to miss out on the playoffs this year. I had two teams from the NFC South making the playoffs, the Falcons and the Panthers. Obviously, it's week two, so well, it's going to be week three soon, but it's still early. But you look at... Drew Brees and that Saints team, something seems off with the offense, something seems off with the defense, something seems off with that entire team. And I get whatever, week one, you're still maybe a little bit rusty, your starters don't necessarily play too much in the preseason, whatever, week one, you lose to the Bucks. fine, we saw Fitzpatrick continue it on week two against the Eagles. But beating the Browns the way that they did, having to come from behind against a Browns team who, I mean... I saw fans on Twitter basically saying if Tyrod doesn't step it up, it's got to be Baker Thursday night. If the Browns are playing that bad and you got to score 18 in the fourth just to win by three and you need that Browns kicker to, I mean, miss as many field goals as he did, there is a problem there. Wouldn't you say so? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. To win against the Browns on such a minimal basis, you're struggling as a team. you got to figure it out. Yeah, and I mean, Kamara played well. Michael Thomas still doing his thing, but just something seems off with that team. I'm not necessarily sure exactly what it is, but they obviously need to fix it up because if not, I mean, the Falcons and Panthers will pass them up and somehow, some way, Tampa Bay seems to be the best <laughs> team in that division after two weeks. I'm not really sure how that's the case. I mean, I was talking a big game before the season saying... Tampa Bay would definitely go 0-3. And they got Pittsburgh next week, I believe. Tampa Bay. Pittsburgh has looked just as bad as anyone else in this league. I mean, Tampa Bay could very well go 3-0 to start the season. And then that's where you definitely do have an issue with Jameis and Fitzpatrick. And I'm not on the start Fitzpatrick week 4 if they win next week. Um, Hype train yet. But I'm kind of second guessing it right now. So... We'll see what ends up happening. Either way, oh yeah, we got Monday night. Uh, that's not necessarily a great Monday night game. I mean, yeah. come on, yes, we got Steelers, Tampa Bay. Uh, what do you think of that game? Um, nah, that just seems boring. I mean, you'll see Fitzpatrick in that one. Um, isn't Winston still out for one more game? Yeah, he's going to be yeah. out one more game. And so. with the Steelers struggling, I mean, you might get your win from the Buccaneers there, but then I don't see them going any more than... 4-0, and 5-0, and anything like that. Yeah, so we'll see what ends up happening. But ESPN, it would be really bad for them if Fitzpatrick decided to turn it right. Fitzpatrick on Monday night. Either way, I mean, we'll see what ends up happening. We're going to go ahead and wrap up this segment. Next segment, I will be, well, we will be talking Josh Gordon to the Patriots and also previewing, previewing tonight's Monday night game between the Bears and Seahawks. So stay tuned, and we will be right back. The average SUV has two blind spots, weighs between four and 6,000 pounds, and takes about six seconds to stop. Remember this the next time you're on foot. Pay attention, people. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. And 
Welcome back to the GSMC Football Podcast. So far today, me and Ariane have talked games on Sunday, obviously. The Sunday night football game, we had Tate on for that second segment. And then for this last segment, the third segment, we talked Falcons and Panthers. Now we move on to the fourth to finish out the show. And we mentioned it earlier in the third segment. Now we're going to talk more about it. You got Josh Gordon. He is now a New England Patriot. I don't know why these teams continue to help out the Patriots. But, I mean, now Tom Brady's got a new weapon there. I mean, is it is this even fair at this point? I don't think it is. It's like you're just giving candy to babies at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good little way to put it. I mean, Gordon went to the Patriots for a fifth-round pick. I would think Josh Gordon is more valuable than a fifth, but I know these GMs, I'm sure it was Bill Belichick who was on the phone talking with John Dorsey, but I'm sure Belichick was in his ear talking about, oh, well, I mean, we'll give you a fifth. John Dorsey's maybe like, ah, it's a little low. Bill Belichick tells him, well, I mean, he fell a lot of drug tests, he's been suspended. How do you know that we can trust him to be here? This very well could not work um, work out on our part. And you know what's going to happen. It's going to work out. Josh Gordon is, I'm not going to say he's going to have a Randy Moss type of year. I mean, Randy Moss was absolutely absurd in that his first year with the Patriots. And it's kind of like that. I mean, Randy Moss was basically terrible with the Raiders for two years. I mean, who wasn't terrible with the Raiders during those <laughs> years? But, I mean, yeah, you see Josh Gordon going from, I'd say, a bad situation in Cleveland to probably the best situation you can go to. In, or a bad situation in Cleveland going to the best situation you could to in New England. I don't think Josh Gordon is going to have any more slip-ups. I mean... From what I've seen over the last year from him, and I guess reports and all that, seems like he's finally got his head on straight. Like I said, it's another weapon for Tom Brady, and this basically fixes up any problems at the receiver position that the Patriots had. Does this does this make me think that they're going to be a team who makes it out to the Super Bowl? I'm still kind of holding off on that. Again, teams don't necessarily go to the Super Bowl three years in a row. I mean, historically, it just hasn't happened that way. And I think, I mean, eventually, yeah, the Patriots are going to lose an AFC Championship game or an AFC Divisional game. That's just my thoughts on it. Do you think the Patriots are still clear, super, um, can, or it's clear-cut favorites to make it out the AFC? Or are you kind of, maybe it's someone else, someone else's time this year, at least. It's someone else's time. And I'm not just saying that just because, you know, I'm not a big fan of theirs. But, you know, with Josh... Gordon, that's definitely an asset. Hopefully he doesn't, you know, blow that opportunity. But I don't think it's enough to keep them going to the Super Bowl for another year. Yeah, and I mean, this does elevate them. And like I said, I mean, they will be in the AFC Championship game. And it's more just so a prediction, just like a gut feeling. I mean, logic does tell us both that, yes, they will be in the Super Bowl. And would I be shocked if they made it to the Super Bowl? No, I'm assuming you wouldn't be shocked either. No, not trying to look, not trying to watch another Super Bowl with them, though. Like, I don't think anybody really wants to watch another Super Bowl with the Patriots. They want somebody new, give somebody else a turn. Yeah, I guarantee you're not the only one with that feeling. I mean, right. sure, I'd like to see the Jags. I mean, watching, like, at this point, I'm kind of like, you know what, it's Tom Brady. I think we all can accept his greatness at this point. I mean, I used to be a big LeBron hater in the NBA. And I was like, well, he keeps beating my team every year. So <laughs> why don't I just enjoy it, huh? Write it out. Yeah, so I guess I'll just write it out. But like I said, I wouldn't be opposed to the Patriots going to the Super Bowl. It's just, I just don't think it will happen this year. Again, I'm just going off of probability, just pure numbers at this point. But like I said, logically, they probably will be back. This does clear up any problems they had at the wide receiver position. You got Edelman coming back after week four. Throw Chris Hogan in the slot. Let's not forget, oh, yeah, they got that guy, Rob Gronkowski. Turns out he's actually a very good tight end. Probably the best in the NFL. As I'm saying this out loud, I'm starting to think, yeah, this team's going to go back to the Super Bowl again. <laughs> but, I mean, we'll see what ends up happening again. Gordon, I'm so glad I didn't cut him from my fantasy team. I know a lot of people did when that report of the Browns possibly cutting. Or Brown, like, there was a report that came out at first that the Browns were going to cut him. I think the Browns realized, wait, he's actually good. Let's get some value for him. And I guess now with the Browns, I mean, do you like them trading Josh Gordon? Because he did, I guess the story is he did injure his hamstring at a little promotional thing for the team and did show up late to the team facility. And of course, he's had issues in the past. Do you think they should have just kept going with him? Or was it, you know what, that's enough. We should move on from you. I think they should have kept him. I don't, you know... You have a little slip up here and there, but he, 
I don't think that he'll blow. Of course, like I said, he's not going to blow that opportunity with uh, the Patriots. Mm-hmm. But for them, they they should have just kept him and let him, you know, mature with them. I understand it's the Browns, so he probably wouldn't have been happy there. But he could at least, you know, hone his skill a little bit more to help them out. Yeah, I, I get that. It's just, I guess the Browns are making the, I mean, making a move that they wouldn't have made. I mean, the last 20 years. The Browns have always had that terrible, pretty much culture around there, which is a losing culture, and they're just constantly making the wrong decisions. And, I mean, right now, again, Josh Gordon, when he's out there and playing to the best of his ability, is a top five receiver in the NFL. But I just like with the Browns being, like I said, that losing culture over the last 20 years, like this is a move that you probably shouldn't make, but it's a move you kind of have to make. And this is a move where... We're probably going to be laughing at the end of the season saying, what were they thinking? Why did they trade him? But I'm not going to knock the Browns for making this move because I think I get their line of thinking again. I mean, if you got Josh Gordon injuring himself at, I mean, not at practice or a game, then obviously it's a bit of a problem. And if he's showing up late to team facilities, then you kind of just got to move on from the guy. So I get it. But again, I mean, I don't doubt myself laughing at them at the end of the season if Gordon goes off and the Patriots are in the Super Bowl and winning it. Mm-hmm. So we move on from that, and this will be the last part of today's show. We got the Monday night football game going on between Seattle and Chicago. Last week, Seattle ended up losing to Denver 27-24. Sebastian Janikowski missed two field goals. Obviously, if he makes those, they win 30-27. Kickers, obviously, not off to a great start to start the season. Chicago, I mean, started off hot in that first half against Green Bay. Then Rodgers comes in. Like I said, I think Trubisky was a bit shook. We got the yips a bit, seeing him and just dominating. Trubisky pretty much looked like a rookie in that second half and struggled. What do you think about like who do you who do you think is going to end up taking this game tonight? I got Seattle on this game in my pick. Um, you know, Russell Wilson is a pretty consistent quarterback, and he'll make a move if he has to. He knows how to see if he needs to step it up or if he can depend on his receivers or you know running backs that kind of thing i think the bears quarterback is new at that especially if he gets a little intimidated by a veteran yeah and you're right about i mean mitch trubisky like this isn't like he hasn't been with these guys for two years these are all new weapons taylor gabriel Mm -hmm. anthony miller Allen robinson i mean cohen tree cohen and jordan howard have been there but again it's a new offense so you do make a good point there and a good point about um russell wilson being consistent i mean you can always count on russell wilson to give you a good game i mean He's a top five quarterback, I think, at least. I mean, do you fall in that same, or you think he's kind of outside that top five? I wouldn't put him, like, at the top top, but I'm there with you. He's good enough for you to notice him. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I mean, when you got the Seahawks, lost a lot of players on the defense. Offense isn't anything to ride home about. But when you do have, in my opinion, a top five coach in Pete Carroll and a top five quarterback in Russell Wilson, they are going to give you the best opportunities to win. I mean, looking at the Bears tonight, they're at home. That's obviously a plus. Playing at Soldier Field is obviously tough for road teams. But it's just, I think I'm leaning with you and going Seattle in this game. As much as I want the Bears to do good, I mean, you guys know I've been talking about the Bears since the end of, or since the middle of last season, thinking they were going to be the next up and coming team, which I still do think that is the case. But looking at it tonight, it's just, I can't pick against Russell Wilson and the experienced team here. I like Trubisky. I like that offense. I like that defense. It's just, I got to go with Wilson and Carroll in this one. I mean, it could go either way. I could be wrong. Wrong. Would I be mad if I was wrong? Of course not. Vegas has the Bears actually favored by four points in this one. I'm a bit surprised at that. I mean, looking at how Seattle played last week, given Denver's 2-0 and now, and I guess Chicago just completely hiding under the covers from the boogeyman Aaron Rodgers last week. That is a bit high, I think. But again, I mean, on Friday, I was complaining about the Falcons being six-point favorites against the uh, Panthers, and they ended up covering, winning by seven. <laughs> So, I mean, what do I know, right? I'm just the guy with the podcast. But either way, we'll see what ends up happening. I mean, week two, I'd say, was pretty solid in the NFL. I mean, Sam Darnold came back down to earth. Of course, I do think he is still going to be the top franchise quarterback for that team and will be a good quarterback. Uh, Dak Prescott played much better Sunday night. Uh, Like I said, the Falcons, I mean, played much better in the red zone. Anything else? The Bills, I mean, that they're, that's they might they might just be the new Browns if we're being honest here. I mean the Browns at least got talent. They're at least competing. The Bills, I mean getting blown out, having guys retire during halftime, <laughs> it's not looking good over there. And plus, 
you play in Buffalo. I mean, it's no California, would you say? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. Let's not forget on Thursday night we had the Bengals beating up on the Ravens. Andy Dalton looking like a good quarterback. And the Bengals might just mess around and win that division. I mean, it's too early. I'm not going to be changing any of my divisional predictions or anything like that. But the Steelers haven't looked good. They need Le'Veon Bell, it's clear. The Browns, as well as they've been playing for three, three and a half quarters, they still tend to turn into the Browns for the last five minutes. And then you got the Ravens who, yeah, you blew out the Bills, but the Bengals clearly showed they were the much better team on Thursday. So maybe Andy Dodd, Marvin Lewis will be back to making it to the playoffs and losing, I mean, the opening playoff game like they usually do. But either way, that's all we got for today's show. I want to thank Ariane once again for coming on today's show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was definitely fun. She'll be back on for the rest of the week. We'll be Tomorrow we'll be recapping the Monday night football game, obviously, between the Bears and Seahawks, along with talking about any other storylines going on currently in the NFL. So like I said, thanks for listening to the GSMC Football Podcast. As always, I am your host, Jesse Tapia. And like I said, we'll be back tomorrow. So talk to you guys later. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.